I'd like to speak this morning about God's saving grace. This is actually the first sermon of a three-part sermon. Uh, I've preached on and off through, through the years. And uh, this is part one. We're going to talk about grace and works. So, what is grace? Well, in the Greek, the word is karis. Karis. And it's used in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways that it's used, it's used as a favor or a kindness or even a sh uh, showing a friendship. In Genesis 6, 8, we see in the Bible that uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And if you think of the times that we're speaking of, man was about to get written off, just taken off the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor, and therefore he and his family were able to be saved. 2 Timothy 1.9, speaking there, uh, talking about God himself, says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Another common definition is God's forgiving mercy. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, we can see where it says, did I turn this on? I wasn't thinking about it. I did not. But good thing we have the other. Ephesians 2, 5, the Bible says, even when we were dead in sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Also, we can call grace the gospel as distinguished from the law. Two different concepts here. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 17, probably one of the most famous verses that speaks about grace. It says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth were given by Jesus Christ. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Speaking to Christians of today, and then even. Also, uh, charis is used as a gift. It says, For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. We also see in 1 Corinthians 16, 3, the Apostle Paul says, Then when I arrive, I will send those whom you approve with letters of explanation to carry your gift to Jerusalem. That was an expression of, of love that they gave uh, to the saints in Jerusalem who were going through a hard time at that point. And 1 Corinthians 12, 4, another well-known text that says, there are diversities of gifts. And the word there is charisma, a derivative of charis, but the same spirit. This is where, in years past, we talked about the charismatic movement. It came from this scripture, from the word charisma. And so... Grace is a gift. Probably another of the most well-known texts when we talk about grace is this one in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. The scripture says, And he and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. The power dread and trespasses and sin, in which you were once. Uh, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. I like this scripture, that text. Sometimes we forget we were the same as those we wish to point the finger at. And we, we also need 
God's saving grace, even as Christians. Let's keep going. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow, what a place to be. Let's keep going. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, the scripture says, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We will look, uh, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're going to look at grace and works. In your, and in this series, what I have is grace and works, the first part. Faith and obedience, the second part. And then responsibility is the third part. But today we're looking at grace and works. Again, I have there at the bottom the uh, scripture. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You ever heard the old saying, you made your bed, now you got to sleep in it? I have. Probably our parents told us that. Well, you know, the good Lord says the same thing to us. You made your bed, now you got to sleep in it. The good Lord told us, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. And if we continue reading the scripture, it says, but the free, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But for the wages of sin is death. So we ask the question, what are wages? The wages are what you earn. For example, we use the example here, every day you go to work. Those of us that are blessed and are able to go to work these days, because not everyone is. But every day you go to work, and you work there, and your boss, your supervisor, however you want to call them, uh, you work your 40 hours or however many hours you are working these days, and then uh, the boss at the end of the week comes up to you and says, Lance, because you're such a good guy, I'm going to give you this check. And Lance is going to say, uh-uh. You're not giving me anything. It's not a gift. I earned that check. Thank you very much. I'll take my check. Those are wages. You earned them. So, again, so the question, does your boss pay you at the end of the week because they're just very nice? No. You have worked and you have earned that which is coming to you. And by the way, to make you even happier, we're halfway through the slides already. How's that? <laughs> Somebody say amen. No, don't say amen. <laughs> All right. And you know, the Lord also agrees about the concept of wages and working and earning that which is yours. Because in Romans 4, 4, it says, Now to him that works, and in the, in the Greek the word is ergozami, the previous where it uh, talks about the wages of sin and death, the word there, wages, is ergon. So to him that works, the recompense is not counted as a gift, as cutties, but of debt, meaning your boss owes you. And therefore, that's why they're paying you your wages. So the question comes up, why do we need God's grace? Why do we need God's grace? So if we answer the question, then we need to know, consider the consequences of our life of sin. The word consequence comes from the Latin. It comes from two words, con, means with or together, and seguir, which means to follow. And in Spanish, the word is seguir, same basic word. Uh, and so these are things that come together. And so if we sin, we will be receiving that which comes with sin, which is the wages of sin. And again, what are the wages of sin? is death. We're not talking about physical death. Everybody dies whether you're going to have it or not. Everybody dies. 
The concept here is spiritual death, that you are no longer, remember in the beginning we said that, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? It means you no longer find, are found with grace in the eyes of the Lord. And therefore, uh, as mom used to say to us, you're going downstairs, she used to tell us. We didn't have a two-story house or a basement. <laughs> so that's not what she was talking about. She says, if you don't behave, you're going downstairs. So, for the wages of sin is death. In the beginning, the Lord said, the Lord said to Adam, and I, I remember I was thinking, so did he say it to just Adam or to Adam and Eve? No, it was just Adam. Eve wasn't around yet. He said, but of the, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. And the reason was, he went on to say, uh, thou shalt not eat, because the day, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so God told him then, the day you eat of that fruit, in other words, the day you disobey me is the idea here. God gave him a commandment. And he says, the day you disobey my commandment, you shall surely die. Did they drop dead like Sapphira and Anira? No. They didn't drop dead, but they did, he did, they did die in the eyes of God. And in Genesis, the serpent says unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And you know what? All he added was one little word, not. For God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know what? Isn't it appealing to be like gods? Man, he hit right that nerve right where she wanted to, to hear, I think. You'll be just like gods. Like, wow. I want to be like God. And so they partook of that fruit, first the woman and then the man. And you know, it's, it's sad to think about it. They had it made. Mankind had it made, but at that point, uh, it was too late. Remember, the best lies that have ever been told have to have an element of truth in them. And that makes it a good lie. And so the element of truth was, uh, here, for God knows that in the day you eat thereof, and you know it's true. They ate of the fruit and they, be, they began to know good and evil. What did God, uh, Ab uh, Adam say? The Lord came looking for him and Adam uh, was hiding. And he says, where are you? He says, well, I hid because I was naked. He says, well, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to eat of? And you know, so they actually were opened and they did become of, as gods knowing good and evil. So what is it they actually earned? They earned two things. He drove the man out of the, uh, uh, out of the garden. So he drove out the man from the Garden of Eden. And then this scripture says, For as an animal die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So man surely did die in Adam, in the sense that they lost favor with God. Remember Noah? Found favor in the eyes of God? Well, when we sin, we no longer have that favor. Wow. You know, it's a pretty impressive that uh, grace, the grace of God, can be extended to mankind. Because, you know, we truly do earn the wage. You know, there was a Civil War story. Well, I'll tell you that story in just a bit. But 1 Corinthians says the same thing that we saw before. For as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And we shall indeed be made alive. In the Spirit, first of all. Remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, the charis of the Holy Spirit. We have, we shall be made alive today in the Spirit. We already, as we read earlier, are sitting in heavenly places. We have a place in heaven, in other words. 
because we have believed in Christ Jesus and we've come to him. him. But also, we shall indeed be made alive in Christ in a new body. I'm going to read uh, Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to read the first four verses. The Bible here says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Verse 2, Revelation 21, 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bridge adorned for her husband. For, as a bride, I'm sorry. Adorned for her husband. You know, these days, I don't know whether to put them on or take them off. These glasses. <laughs> it's all the same anymore. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away, shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. We're going to have a new body that is not corruptible. How many people have had to have transplants of some kind? We just had one of our sisters, I believe her sister had a transplant of kidney, if I remember correctly. How many have a, uh, a new hip made of metal? How many have had uh, cataracts operated and things of sorts, or procedures as they call us? Oh, don't worry, it's just a procedure. Anytime they're cutting into you, it's not just a procedure. <laughs> it's serious. Okay, otherwise they wouldn't be doing that. So I don't care what they say. They would never convince me of that. I don't have a hip yet, but someday I might. I remember Jamal told me, how come you limping on that hip? And I'm thinking, yep, one day. One day. But you know what? The Lord will indeed, we shall be indeed made alive. We are alive now in the spirit. And then one day we shall have a new body that is not corruptible. And the scripture says, there shall, well, God shall wipe away every tear. And he says, nor shall there be any more pain. Anybody here have chronic pain? You won't have it anymore. It's a blessing to know. Consider this. Did we as kids, did we as kids always receive the punishment that we truly deserved? And if not, why not? Why didn't we receive what we really deserved? I'd like for you to consider. I love this song. George Strait wrote this in 1990. He released it. It's called A Father's Love. I'm going to try and read it. Got sent home from school one day with a shiner on my eye. Fighting was against the rules, and it didn't matter why. When Dad got home, I told that story just like I'd rehearsed, then stood there on those trembling knees and waited for the worst. And he said, let me tell you a story a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said that daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. When I became a father in the spring of 81, there was no doubt that stubborn boy was just like my father's son. In other words, me. That's what he's saying. And when I thought my patience had been tested to the end, I took my daddy's secret and passed it on to him. I'll jump to the last verse or stanza. Last night I dreamed I died and stood outside those pearly gates. When suddenly I realized there must be some mistake. If they knew half the things I've done, they'll never let me in. Then somewhere from the other side, I heard these words again. Let me tell you a secret about a father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. 
It's a love without end. Amen. God loves us. His grace is so great. There's no reason he has to extend it, but he does. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's nothing we could do to earn that salvation. The Apostle Paul was possibly one of the apostles that worked more than any of all the other 11 combined. And yet, even after all that he did, after all the beatings he took, after being uh, crucified himself later, he could never repay what God had done for him. Nor can we repay what God has done for us. I love this song. But really the difference is not what we do. It's God's love for us. Again, let me read it one more time. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, the caris of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, where it says works, it means you didn't earn it. God gave it to you. You know, if anyone today is subject to the gospel call, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Bible says, uh, in verse 36, the men asked the men and brethren, what shall we do? The apostle Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of the sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus himself said in uh, Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Why be damned? Why be condemned? Come forward today if you are subject to the call. Jesus loves you and has provided his grace that you might be saved today for the rest of your life. Let us stand and sing.